Buenos días, good morning, uh, dear colleagues. We are going to start uh, this uh, presentation uh, about the cardiac resecution therapy, and the first speaker is Oscar Cano with uh, the topic Surety European Survey. Sorry for a few minutes because they are um, trying to, to connect the laptop of Dr. Worley. No se escucha. No se escucha. Okay. Good morning, and uh, thank you, Dr. Alfueta and Dr. Latino. Firstly, I would like to thank the organizers, both the Sección de Estimulación and Sección de Arritmias, uh, for inviting me to participate in this, I think, really interesting uh, session dedicated to cardiac uh, resynchronization therapy. It is also a great honor for me to share this session with such a great faculty. Having said that, during the following 15 minutes, we are going, uh, to I'm going to describe the principal results of the second European CRT survey. And I think that this is a really good starting point for this se session, because what we are going to see is a real a snapshot of uh, the current uh, clinical trends in terms of CRT along different countries in Europe. So before starting, a couple of general considerations that we have to take into account. As we, as we all know, current recommendations on CRT arise from the guidelines, and guidelines are uh, based uh, in the results of large randomized clinical trials. The problem is that randomized clinical trials uh, include highly selected patients that do not represent the real life. So if we want to know what is happening in real life, we have to rely on other kind of data uh, from all the kind of studies with lower level of evidence, such as observational studies, uh, registries, and also surveys. And this is the rationale for this European CRT survey. So the first edition of the European CRT survey was conducted between 2008 and 2009 in 13 ESC countries. And the, the main result of this uh, first edition of the survey was that implanters were extrapolating the benefits of CRT to a broad population beyond the populations included in the guidelines. And that means patients above 75 years old, patients with narrow QRS, with atrial fibrillation, and patients receiving upgrading procedures. And as we all know, all these populations have been usually underrepresented or even excluded from randomized clinical trials. Another important contribution of this first edition of the survey was that there were considerable regional and national differences between the participating countries. So the second European CRT survey is a ESC initiative from the European Heart Rhythm Association at the Heart Failure Association. The aim of this survey is to provide essential da data on CRT implantation practice and utilization of healthcare resources in consecutive patients undergoing implantation of a CRT device. The survey will also permit national and international benchmarker of centers, and this is a 12-month snapshot survey with no follow-up. So the rationale and the design of the survey was published in 2015. Briefly, uh, 47 ESC uh, member countries were invited to participate, and finally, 42 have participated in the survey. A national coordinator in each country was assigned whose principal task was the recruitment of the maximum amount of uh, implanting centers in every country. And the survey included consecutive patients uh, scheduled to receive a CRTD or CRTP device from October 2015 to December 2016. All data was uh, introduced into two internet-based questionnaires. The first one was a one-time site description questionnaire, which basically reflected the principal characteristics of the implanting center. And the second one was an internet-based electronic case report form. 
So let's take a look to the principal uh, results of this uh, second European CRT survey, which have been very recently published in the European Journal of Heart Failure. Overall, uh, 11,088 patients have been included in the survey, and the top three recruiting countries have been Poland in the first place, the Czech Republic, and Spain in the third place, with 847 patients included. An important concept of this survey is the concept of representativeness, which means uh, which percentage of the total expected implantations during the uh, inclusion period have been captured by the survey. And this representativeness has been 11 persons. So 11 persons of the total expected CRT implantations during the inclusion, inclusion period have been captured by the survey. With respect to the clinical indication for the CRT implantation in the survey, most of the patients had a heart failure with white QRS or heart failure and LV dysfunction with an indication for an ICD. But importantly, up to 23% of the patients included had a pacemaker indication and an expected RV patient dependency, which is uh, an indication with a lower level of evidence in current guidelines. Most of the patients uh, were implanted with an elective uh, admission, 77%, and a successful implantation was achieved in 97% of all the patients. The device was a CRT device in 70% of the, uh, of the patients and a CRTP device on 30% of the, of the patients. The, implant, the implanter was an electrophysiologist in around 77% of the cases, but more than 20% of the, of the cases were performed by other kind of physicians. <clears throat> the LB lead was placed successfully in up to 99% of the, of the cases, and 9% of the LB leads were implanted uh, epicardially by a surgeon. As we can see here, uh, currently up to 57% of all LB leads implanted currently are multipolar leads, and uh, only 1% are uh, unipolar leads. With respect to the final LB lead position, uh, this was, uh, was assessed by uh, biplane X-ray in most part of the patients, and the final position was a lateral and mid position in around 70 to 8 percent of the cases in concordance with, with the current recommendations. And importantly, and maybe Dr. Leiva can comment on this later on, on his presentation, only 34% of the patients had an LB lead, uh, the LB lead position was optimized by any method, electrical method or uh, by imaging method. After the implant, uh, device programming, AV program, and BB interval program was performed in around 60% of the patients, and device-based software for optimization of these intervals was used only in 36% of the patients. With respect to morbidity and mortality data, uh, the mortality was only 0.4%, but we have to take into account that this is a snapshot survey. We don't have follow-up, so we don't know what happened after the discharge uh, of the patient. And major adverse events uh, were 5% and ba basically driven by worsening of heart failure, worsening of renal function, or arrhythmias. And finally, uh, after implantation on discharge, patients had uh, optimal medical therapy in most part of the cases, and around 50% of patients were on oral anticoagulants. Let's take a look now uh, to the comparison of the principal results between the different countries included in the survey. As we can see here, the median age of the patients included overall in the survey was 70 years. And here, depicted in red, we have the percentage of patients above 75 years. 32% of the patients about, uh, included in the survey were above 75 years. But if we look in the right side of the of this slide, we, we have here represented 10 bars of the top 10 recruiting countries in the, in the survey. And we can see that there are significant differences in terms of the age of the patients, with patients, uh, more than 50% of patients above 75 years in some countries, like Italy, and on the other side, only 12% of patients above 75 years in other countries.
that means that the selection criteria for patients undergoing CRT uh, are different between the different countries. With respect to the gender distribution and in according to uh, previous uh, studies, uh, women were underrepresented in the survey. Only 24% of patients were women and this was dis distributed in a similar fashion in, uh, in the different countries. The heart failure etiology, uh, overall 45% of patients were ischemic, were ischemic 50% non-ischemic, but once again we can see differences between the different countries. In some countries, non-ischemic uh, patients were uh, the, the most important amount of patients. And the New York Heart Association functional class was uh, three to four in 60 percent overall, and 38 percent were in class two. But once again, we have countries with more than 80 percent of the patients in class three, four, and other countries with a predominantly class two patients. Left ventricular reaction fraction below 25 percent in 28 percent of the uh, of the sample. 23% uh, of the patients had LVF uh, above 35%, and once again, dif significant differences between the different countries included in the survey. The basal rhythm was predominantly sinus, but up to 26% of the patients were in atrial fibrillation. And with respect to the QRS morphology, 73% of the overall survey had a left bundle branch block, which means that 27% had a non-left bundle branch block. And if we look here, there are some countries with up to 40% of patients with a non-left bundle branch block, whereas here in Spain, uh, more than 83% of the patients had a left bundle branch block. The QRS duration was broad, above uh, 150 milliseconds in 74% of the patients, but up to 13% of the patients had QRS below 130, and we know that current guidelines do not recommend CRT uh, with, uh, with QRS uh, below 130 milliseconds. And finally, uh, significant differences, once again, in the length of hospital stay overall, more than 50% of the patients had less than and four days of hospital stay, but significant differences between the different countries, and this has to do with the, uh, with the health system of every country, of course. But for example, here in the UK, more, at least 70% uh, of the patients had a hospital stay below four days. Whereas in other countries, we have hospital stays above four, above four days in uh, more than 70% of the patients, and even uh, above se seven days of a stay. So as we have seen, uh, the second European CRT survey show us uh, what, what, is happen what is happening in terms of CRT in the different countries and basically allow us to answer this question, who is doing what and to whom and how uh, in terms of CRT. So who is doing uh, CRT implantation? As we have seen, primarily EPs, but 23% are not EPs. What are we implanting? Basically, CRTD devices, 70%, but in some countries, up to 40% CRTP devices. To whom are we implanting these devices? Mostly men with low left ventricular reaction fraction, in sinus, left under branch block, and white QRS, that is according to current guidelines. And how are we doing these implants? Mostly as elective implantations with low periprocedural mortality, and importantly, referrals from non-implanting centers accounted only for 25%, which may uh, reflect that patients who are away from tertiary centers or university hospitals have a more difficult access to the therapy. So globally, we can say that uh, the, the indications for, for CRT are according to the clinical, uh, the, the current guidelines, but the survey also allows us to show, to show us the real life, and the real life is, the, is that we follow the guidelines, but we do also another things beyond the guidelines. We do 28% uh, 20, of upgrading procedures from previous devices, we, what we would know that has a, le a lower level of evidence. 26% um, of implants are in natural fibrillation, up to 8% of uh, patients had narrow QRS and another 5% QRS between 120 and 130. And in general, compared with randomized clinical trials, patients included in the CRT survey were older, had more comorbidities, were less likely to have ischemic disease, had higher left ventricular reaction fraction, narrower QRS, and more atrial fibrillation. 
So in conclusion, the second European CRT survey reflects contemporary clinical practice, show us, uh, give us some feedback on the guideline uh, adherence, show us important similarities, but also substantial differences in terms of patient selection, implantation procedure, and follow-up, permits meaningful benchmarking and comparison between different uh, countries, and finally also permits the initiation of educational initiatives and future research. I would like to end by just saying thank you to all the Spanish centers who have collaborated in this uh, survey, and thank you very much for your attention. So let's, thank you very much. Let's move to the next presentation that is going to be uh, Usefulness of Pre-Implant Imaging Techniques and Navigation Systems to Guide Left Ventricular Lead Implantation by Francisco Leiva. Thank you very much indeed. I'm extremely grateful for the uh, Scientific Committee to, uh, uh, for inviting me to my hometown, uh, Seville. Um, so, I mean, as, as you can see from here, this is uh, from the survey, uh, this is a, a very widely practiced uh, technique uh, for implantation, which is now more than 20 years old. It is very effective, about 70% of patients uh, respond, and there is, importantly, a um, prognostic benefit. Uh, so if you compare that to other therapies, for example, AF ablation, uh, it is very effective. Um, uh, most centers are not using any other uh, form of uh, optimizing the left ventricular lead uh, position, but nevertheless, uh, the response is pretty good. So let's try and review what we're trying to do in CRT. This is work by Princeton uh, and colleagues uh, from Maastricht University who have done a great deal of work in the field uh, over the past 30 years. And one uh, study, in one study, they provided uh, a lot of information regarding the segmental contribution uh, to the mechanics of the myocardium during left ventricular pacing. To that end, they use a SOC, uh, an electrode SOC, uh, in animals, and uh, then uh, using a cardiac MRI to look at the mechanical response uh, and the electrodes to look at the electrical response, they were able to build uh, PV loops, pressure volume loops, uh, in both in intrinsic rhythm during a left bundle branch block and during bivent pacing. And as you can see from here, the distribution of myofiber work during a left bundle branch block is very different in the left ventricular free wall. Those fibers are doing a lot more work than the septal fibers, and it is that redistribution of work that we are trying to correct with biventricular pacing. And as you can see, once you place the lead uh, uh, in, in the optimal site, there is redistribution of desynchrony, correction of desynchrony, and correction of the myocardial uh, fiber uh, work. Now, this is a study uh, which we uh, did some, uh, some time ago, uh, looking at the uh, electromechanical effects of uh, different pacing sites. And these are uh, insight maps taken uh, at different pacing locations, proximal, mid, and apical segments. Uh, and if you just look at snapshots of 60 seconds and 100 seconds throughout the R to R interval, you can see very different um, uh, patterns of electrical activation. And as you can see here, with the apical, you've got a breakthrough, you've got a functional uh, uh, block uh, just here. And as you can see, by the time you reach 100 milliseconds, that apical uh, stimulation has already gone. It's much faster than the proximal um, uh, stimulation in that particular patient. So if you pace from different points in the, in the ventricle, you get different electrical uh, effects, and you get functional blocks as well. We also did a study of uh, 19 patients with uh, uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy, and we put a, um, a decapolar lead over the zone of myocardial infarction. Uh, and we then used different um, uh, pacing protocols to try and see what the mechanical response was in terms of uh, left ventricular DPDT. And as you can see in individual patients, some patients have a similar response, a 10% increase. Some patients, however, like patient five here, has a negative response, a negative DPDT, which is no benefit. Some other patients, for example, have a positive response, but a negative response to other sites. So there are patients who respond to 
everything, whatever you pay, there are some patients who only respond to one particular left ventricular pacing site, but you can improve that by changing the site. And there are some patients who do not respond to anything. Every single vector is negative. So there are some universal responders. That whatever you put the lead, they're going to respond. Some patients who can be improved and other patients who uh, will not respond to anything at all. And we'll go through the reasons as to that, what that might be later. There's been quite a lot of work on echocardiography, and this has adopted the hypothesis that if you pace area of latest mechanical activation, you're likely to do benefit. Um, to that end, there are uh, several studies have been uh, undertaken, and the starter study is one of them, um, probably one of the best ones, and also the target study uh, showed a similar result. They basically use speckle tracking echocardiography to look at the <coughs> mechanical dyssynchrony in different uh, segments, and then instructed the uh, implanter to put the lead in the area of latest mechanical activation, provided that the uh, strain was greater than 6.8. So these are potentially viable segments that are contracting late. And as you can see, that if you have an echo guide, uh, guidance compared to no echo, echo guidance, uh, you have a significant response uh, at six months in terms of uh, event-free survival, but actually it disappears at 24 months. If you then look at the position of the leads, though that, and those that were concordant or adjacent to the most ideal site, you do see a significant difference between those leads. A similar study was the target study, but then again, if you look at the analysis uh, of the data according to SCAR rather than to latest mechanical activation, you get a wide separation of the kaplan meier curves. Um, so these are patients uh, who have SCAR, uh, i.e. a strain of less than 6.8, and these are patients who have uh, a viable uh, myocardium. So this to me tells me that SCAR is probably more important than just late mechanical activation. And in my view, these studies haven't really uh, confirmed whether it is late mechanical activation or uh, viability in the PACE segment that uh, are important. We as others have uh, undertaken a, a few studies on uh, the role of cardio mag cardiovascular magnetic resonance in CRT. And one of the important things about magnetic resonance is that it gives you a uh, view on the cause of the myocardial problem we're trying to address. All of these patients were said to have dilated cardiomyopathy on the basis of echocardiography and a normal coronary angiogram or abnormal coronary angiogram. Uh, but as you can see, the picture is quite different to that. This is an LAD infarct, and as you can see here, this is <coughs> subendocardial, almost transmural infarct of the LAD. This is a transmural circumflex uh, infarct in a dominant circumflex. This is a thin uh, right ventricular infarct, uh, sorry, inferior uh, predominantly uh, infarct. But this is, for example, not an infarct. This is patchy distribution of uh, late gadolinium enhancement in a patient with myocarditis. This, on the other hand, is an infarct with uh, left ventricular non-compaction cardiomyopathy. And this is a patient with dilated cardiomyopathy and mid-wall fibrosis, uh, which um, uh, several groups have shown uh, poor tense and poor outcome. So what appears to be a dilated cardiomyopathy on echocardiography is not at all uh, on cardiovascular magnetic resonance. And that really dictates um, a, a lot of things that we're trying to do in CRT. Very early on, uh, so we, we, uh, we observed that the area of myocardium, according to viability, is very important in determining the electrical characteristics of pacing. As you can see, this is the intrinsic uh, cure restoration in a patient with a left bundle branch block, a cure restoration of 169 milliseconds. If we then put the lead over viable myocardium, here is the anterior, almost a marginal, um, uh, segment, which is supposed not to be as good as a, a lateral segment, you can see a, mass, a, a marked a reduction in the QRS complex at acceptable thresholds. If, on the other hand, you pick what we think is the ideal site, 
This is a lateral site. Just here, you can see that this is actually infarcted, and the cure restoration is much higher than that, 198 milliseconds with unacceptable threshold. Now, in that particular patient, there is a correlation between the threshold and scar, but this is not the case in uh, all patients. Now, an important aspect of this, and this is something which has been looked at by the uh, St. Bartholomew's uh, uh, group and the, and the Aldo Rinaldi's group is that QLV doesn't necessarily mean viability. You can, the, there is a weak relationship between QLV and the acute hemodynamic response of the ventricle, but actually, uh, like in this patient, for example, you have a very long QLV, which is supposed to be the, substrate, the best substrate for pacing, but actually this is over scar. So you cannot be sure whether a, Q, a, a, a high QLV is actually in an area of viable uh, myocardium. In 2007, we took 69 patients and, uh, with ischemic cardiomyopathy and looked at, uh, retrospectively, uh, looked at their um, outcomes. And as you can see from here, patients who have a non postrolateral scar do very well compared to patients who have the lead placed over a transmural myocardial scar, and the hazard ratio here is 18. So there's a lot more events happening in patients who receive a left ventricular lead over an area of uh, non-viable myocardium. And the same applies to the combined endpoint of, of cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalizations. A bigger study in which we took uh, nearly 600 patients in our center, um, in this study, we looked at patients who had a cardiac MRI scan, and then we subdivided the patients into those who have a, had a left ventricular lead placed over an area of scar, and patients who had the lead placed over an area of no scar. And as you can see here, there is a very marked difference of about 20, actually, 20-fold in the number of events collected in those patients. Now, as expected, the patients who did not have a cardiac MRI scan and who had the left ventricular lead uh, placed via uh, fluoroscopy only uh, had an intermediate uh, rate of outcomes. We then combined and adopted the same sort of hypothesis as the target and the um, uh, starter study, and we looked at the possibility um, that placing the lead over areas of late mechanical activation uh, in segments that were viable, such as this one, for example, uh, might be better than placing the lead over scarred segments or areas of early mechanical activation. Um, using the speckle tracking equivalent of cardiovascular magnetic resonance, which is speckle tracking echocardiography, we were able to look at the segments that uh, were viable and also contracting uh, uh, late, as, uh, late. And this is one of the examples uh, here. When you look at where the lead was in relation to clinical outcomes, you can see a wide difference between concordant and non-concordant leads, and that effect was mainly mediated by SCAR. And actually, when you divided patients into late or early mechanical activation, there was no benefit. So that to us means that really it is uh, SCAR White and colleagues from Calgary have also done quite a lot of work on not just the distribution of left ventricular um, uh, scar, but also on the right ventricular scar. And we're able to show in a rather small uh, number of patients, but nevertheless compelling, uh, that placing the right ventricular lead over a zone of scar in either patients with ischemic or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy also portends uh, poor uh, outcomes. Quite a lot of work is being done on fusion, uh, and uh, the way that we normally uh, uh, do this uh, is to look at the cardiac MRI, get an impression of where to put the lead, and then guess from fluoroscopy where the lead should be. And for an experienced operator, that, that is uh, not a problem. But if you had fusion and you had a cardiac MRI scan with SCAR live, at the time of fluoroscopy. That is an elegant way of doing things. Um, and th this is some work being done by Aldo Rinaldi. Now, uh, when you look at the quality of the coronary sinus uh, pictures that you get with this, it's not really very good. And uh, I'm afraid that we, we tend to get this sort of uh, rather um, um, low quality picture. So there is a lot to be done. We need higher resolution images in order to, uh, to do this sort of thing.
Rinaldi and colleagues were able to show that actually if they target areas uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, no scar in a patient who has a lead uh, already, you were able to improve the, the response. And uh, th this is a, 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 um, a software package which is at the moment, at the moment uh, homegrown uh, and which is not far from uh, being out uh, in the market. So the question is whether CT is also of any use. And these are the typical images that you see in presentations. This is a bit more like the images we get, actually, on CT. They're not great. Often patients are in atrial fibrillation, have ectopics, the gating is a problem, and you don't really end up with great images. Also, my impression is that coronary sinus uh, veins that appear to be uh, not that good for pacing. In fact, when it comes to it, you can do venoplasty and you can get the lead in. So the extent to which CT helps in implantation, I have some doubts. Nevertheless, if you look at some study um, like this one, looking at the combination of wall thickness, hypoperfusion, late mechanical activation, and scar, you can see a difference between uh, uh, the, 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 the patients who are in the best site, i.e. those with a low squeeze uh, index, uh, as opposed to patients who don't have a CT. This is a very small study, and it needs to be done in much higher numbers, but it nevertheless uh, it gives you an insight into the usefulness of cardiac CT in patients who already have a device. Now, um, as um, Antonio Barrueta was saying earlier, uh, there are techniques uh, by which you can improve cardiac MRI in patients with devices, um, but they are, they, are, they are not really very widely available. Other groups have used a combination of, uh, of techniques such as CT, micro perfusion imaging, and speckle tracking echo to look at not only mechanical activation but also myocardial thinning and myocardial viability. And this group um, has uh, recently uh, published um, data showing that the left ventricular remodeling response, uh, if you use the combination of this, is much better if you use imaging as opposed to using uh, uh, just uh, fluoroscopy uh, alone. Importantly, this uh, study was not uh, addressed to, uh, whoop, I'm sorry, was not addressed uh, to look at uh, events. Uh, it's just response. So SPECT, can we use SPECT in order to look at myocardial viability? This is something um, which um, has been published some time ago, the correlation between cardiac MRI and histology. And you can see from the pictures that there is a very close, close correlation between late gadolinium enhancement here in a subendocardial infarct. Um, and here, as you can see, there's almost a perfect correlation between them. If, on the other hand, you look at the sort of resolution you see in SPECT, you cannot see where the infarct is. And in particular, SPECT uh, cannot look at subendocardial uh, myocardial infarction. So I think there are limitations uh, from SPECT in doing that. However, uh, this is uh, something from uh, uh, a study from Bose and colleagues, uh, Jagmeet uh, Singh's um, uh, group, showing that uh, non-viability or ischemia in the paced uh, segments uh, does relate to poorer outcomes. So SPECT could be used, but the proviso is that it can only really look at transmural uh, myocardial infarction. I think the whole uh, field of uh, um, uh, placing left ventricular leads and using imaging to place left ventricular leads, uh, it's been turned on its head, actually, by the use of quadrupolar leads. Uh, now we have um, up to 20 or 21 different vectors from which to paste the ventricle, and uh, wherever the lead tip is, in a way, is irrelevant because you can paste from the proximal segment. Uh, so the whole thing has been changed, and my outlook on, on how to use imaging uh, before implantation has also changed. Uh, as a result. We've recently shown in uh, um, patients with a quadrupolar lead, these are 287 patients with a quadrupolar lead compared with 600 patients with a non-quadrupolar lead, and these are patients who are not programmed to multi-site pacing. These are patients for single-site left ventricular pacing, but you can see that those patients who have a quad lead 
have a much and surprisingly dramatic uh, better outcome than patients with a non-quadrupolar lead, and that's independent of known confounders. We're talking about a 69% reduction in mortality, which I couldn't believe when I first saw the data, but we went through the data again, and I'm afraid that that is, that, that, that is the finding, and the same findings on total mortality or heart failure hospitalizations. And importantly, that applies to both CRTD, 58% reduction uh, in total mortality, and perhaps even more in CRTP. And as you can see, this is a very, very small percentage of patients having events. In fact, it was 3.8% mortality, um, which is very, very low when you compare it to the mortality in the general population. So I conclude that uh, CRT is a very effective treatment. Um, there's 97% um, uh, rate of implantation. It can be difficult, as Seth Worley will, will tell us uh, later. There are some very difficult cases, but by and large, um, uh, uh, a very high number of patients can be delivered uh, this therapy. It is very effective. There is a prognostic benefit, and it doesn't really matter whether you use imaging or not imaging. Having said that, there is room to improve uh, things, to increase the, the response uh, by targeting left ventricular lead deployment. Although all the studies that I've presented have not been multicenter randomized studies, there is compelling evidence that left ventricular pacing away from SCAR increases the response. I have reservations as to the use of ECHO, CT, and SPECT for identifying SCAR because they tend to be surrogates. Um, and I think multicenter uh, validation of these techniques in the context of the uh, uh, new quad leads is uh, now required. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Leiva. Next presentation is Advanced Implantation Techniques of the Ventricular Leads Through the Coronary Sinus by Dr. Borley. Thank you very much. Um, I guess my, um, my perspective on, on how well leads are implanted is a little different. I see a lot of patients uh, who, who don't get LB leads implanted. Um, and so these are my disclosures. Uh, and these are my children. And why would I show you my children? Because I want to talk about my other children, which are here. So these are my children by another mother. Um, and you ask, what mother is that? And necessity is the mother of invention. So these are the tools that I developed because I could not put in LV leads uh, reliably using uh, what, what I was provided with. And so I'm going to talk to you today about these because you'll not hear about these unless you hear it from me because there's, it's not a big ticket item. There's not a lot of money to be made selling these. And so there's not much. Um, there's not much advertising, um, and when you're, in, when you're in the room doing a procedure, you'll have a device company offer you the tools. Um, but I think that you'll see that these tools can be very useful and provide you options that you don't have uh, if you, if you uh, are using <coughs> device company tools. And interestingly, um, they, work, they work well with inexperienced doctors, okay? And so this was a study that was done at Duke by Dr. Jackson. And Jackson was a fellow in cardiology, finishing his fellowship. And um, these are the experienced implanters, and these are the young novice implanters. And the novice implanters were willing to try something new, and they used these tools, uh, the tools that I just showed you. And that cut their implant time compared to the more experienced implanting physicians who continued to use their existing tool set uh, by almost half. And what was also interesting uh, is that using uh, these tools, the implant failure rate with the young doctors who were less experienced uh, was lower than the more experienced physicians who continued to use the existing tools that they were provided by the device companies. Um, and they also felt that they got better lead positions. Um, I, over the last six months, I've been involved in 48 implants in patients who had previously failed a, a procedure. Um, and I actually did the procedure in 13 patients, 
but I was, I was the, I just proctoring and watching and, and giving advice on the other 33, um, and all but two of them were successful. One was CS atresia, uh, so there was no opening into the coronary sinus. Uh, the coronary sinus did not open into the, into the right atrium. Uh, and in many of those patients who'd have CS atresia, you can actually implant down the vein of Marshall, but that wasn't an option. And then there was one acutely angulated uh, vein, and we were missing some of the equipment. But th if you approach CRT in a systematic way with a full tool set, you can get better lead position. And one of the things that wasn't mentioned about the target study was that about 50% or 60% of, of the patients actually got the lead in the target. So most of the time, uh, or very frequently, you, although you can target a lead, you don't, you don't get it where you want. Uh, one of the things that I find very important is not just the tools, but how you use them. And that if you try to implant an LV lead with your assistant here, it's not, doesn't work nearly as well as if you have a table that's elevated to the same height as the patient and you work perpendicular to the patient like this. So this can be very important to a successful implant. The contrast injection system is very simple um, and allows you to uh, put a wire into the pacing lead or into the, into the catheter. Um, so the system is designed to, to compensate or, or deal with each step of the procedure and, and counteract whatever problems you encounter. And so there's, the, there's just two shapes to the catheter. There's the standard and the jumbo. Uh, and it, it works like this. And then this one vein selector. And so uh, we'll skip this one. So this is just an example. This is a patient with a previously failed implant. Um, and they, 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 couldn't divide, they couldn't get into the coronary sinus uh, using, the, um, using the device company tools. And by, simply by using this vein selector that I showed you uh, in a glide wire, uh, we were able to, um, and then switch, this is, the, this is the vein selector, this is the braided core, and then this is the Amplatz wire. Uh, and then switching to the jumbo sheath, which is this large sheath here, then we were able to uh, get into the coronary sinus and provide stable access because we have a much larger curve. And then we were able to implant relatively easily, not by skill. And I think it's important to emphasize this is not a skill issue, this is a tool issue. And if you don't have these tools, you can struggle and struggle. If you have the tools, it's fairly simple. And again, I'm, I'm not doing these cases, I'm proctoring people who have not had much experience. It may be the first or second time they've ever used these things. Um, and just another example of, of the same general concept, a previously failed implant, uh, there was a, not able to get anything in using the standard equipment. Uh, and so we switched over to the, uh, the equipment uh, and we, we can find the CS and then use the same technique of the vein selector with the amplat over the glide wire and the amplat. So there's, there's a very routine standard approach to the difficult CS using these tools. One of the other things that's nice about this is the amplat support wire technique. Um, and you can use this in a variety of situations. And the one, one place that you can use it is for the unstable CS. And one of the things about this is you need a nine French access in the coronary sinus. Device companies give you a seven French access. So there's not enough room in the catheter to do this. Um, and this is a, a case where we're, we show you the Amplat support wire. And you can see they were able to just get barely into the coronary sinus. And it was very unstable. Uh, and in the end, they, they got to here, but the, the CS is very unstable and then the lead fell out. But now, by using the vein selector and, the, and a jumbo uh, sheath, we're able to put the vein selector in and then the Amplatz wire, and now we're able to cannulate the CS. And what's, what we do here is we leave the wire in place. You leave the Amplatz wire in place, which then stabilizes the sheath so that you can then go on uh, to do the rest of the procedure with the Amplatz wire. And 
Previously, they had the lead in this branch, but now we have a stable situation. We can go after that branch. But to get the wire into this branch, we're going to use this vein selector, which allows us to aim the wire into the branch. This is, very, this is a very different than a subselector. It has a 2.4 French uh, tip on it, and it allows you to manipulate inside the vein, put the wire down, and more importantly, it allows you to create a, a rail over which you can put the pacing lead. So you can also use this vein selector to uh, get by a, a Vusen's valve. So this is a previously failed implant. <coughs> Uh, two previous attempts, and I'm not doing the case, I'm just, I'm just coaxing, and I, they were able to use this vein selector to get by the valve, and now you can see here's a nice branch up here, uh, but they couldn't get by, and so we used the combination of the vein selector um, and the subselector, and then we're able to, to, place, to pace the, place the lead. Um, with pretty much with ease. Another example you can see here is Vusen's valve and they were unable to get through here and they didn't see any branches proximal to it. Interestingly, uh, when we got beyond Vusen's valve using the vein selector um, and did a venogram, you can see that there's actually a branch that has its takeoff proximal to Vusen's valve, which is sort of odd. And you can see here's the support wire keeping everything in place. And you can see here's this tortuous vessel like here. Um, and using the vein selectors, you're able to negotiate and get this is because this is very soft and you're able to work this in over a wire uh, and then slide the subselector in. So now we've, we've, we've managed to selectively cannulate using the vein selector and then we can pick which branch we want to put our pacing lead in. Um, you know, one of the problems we have with, things, with these subselectors is that you can get the subselector up to the branch, but you can't get it to go into the branch when you, when you have a tortuous vessel. Um, they, also are, they also tend to have poor torque control, and uh, they use a lot of contrast because the internal diameter is about five and a half French. And so when you go to use these, they, they, they soften up in the body, and when you try, even if when you get a wire, you can't get this to go into the branch. And that's what these vein selectors are for. And there's three shapes um, of these, and they're two, they have a 2.4 French tip to engage the small branches. The outside is five French, and what's important, they have, they're braided, and they, they have good torque control, and they maintain good torque control throughout the procedure but they don't deliver the pacing lead. They serve as a, a rail over which to advance uh, the subselector. And what's also nice about them is that they eliminate the need for multiple shaped subselectors. So just to give you an example, um, you can also use these uh, to selectively inject the vein. So here looks like an easy case. You can see there's this big poster lateral branch down here, but nothing else, you don't really see anything else up here. So what happens if you have phrenic pacing or high thresholds? What do you do, right? Because there was no other branches. But if you, if you put the vein selector in here and inject, what you'll see is that there's a, there's a branch up here. So this, there, there was high thresholds and phrenic pacing all along here. But because we injected the branch selectively before we put the lead in, because how many times do you put the lead in and you, and you get high thresholds or phrenic pacing? So before we put the lead in, we injected, the we injected this vein, and now you can see that there's a branch up here. So that's the branch we go after. And you might say, well, that's a very small branch, and I won't be able to get a lead into it. But by using this vein selector and getting the vein selector into the branch, so you can see this is the vein selector here over wires. We can then rail the subselector over the vein selector deep into the branch, which then provides the necessary support uh, to get the lead in.
So combining those two uh, makes it, makes it uh, very useful. Now, I showed you three different shape vein selectors. This is a previously failed implant. You can see this acute angulation right here. Um, and so they, they were, the physicians doing this were unable to engage the branch, which, you, which would not be find too, too unusual. Um, and so we started off using, you can see a just different views of it to get a good sense of what was going to happen. And so I started off with a standard vein selector, and the standard, the standard shape didn't do the job. I couldn't engage it with a standard shape, and I was trying to get a wire to go down, and I couldn't get it to go. So then we switched to the, the vertebral shape, and that didn't work, but then switched over to the hook shape which is actually copied off of an IMA, and it has a very acute angle on it. And you can put that up over a wire and, and torque it towards where you think the branch is, and there it is. So it engaged the branch, but we still have to get the lead in. We can get a wire down, but we still have to deal with that acute angulation. And so how you do that is you put wires into the branch and then you can slide this vein selector deep into the branch over two wires. Now you can see how deep this is. And then we're going to use that as a rail, and now we're sliding up the subselector over the vein selector. So by combining the vein selector and the subselector, we're able to rail this subselector deep into the branch well beyond where that acute angulation was, and then deliver the lead. So this is just a demonstration of the importance of the three different shapes, but also the importance of having a rail that's been created by these vein selectors. If you don't have the vein selectors, this case is done. If you don't have the vein selectors, this patient goes for an, an endocardial lead or an epicardial lead. But with these tools, this is a relatively straightforward procedure. Uh, just a few more examples. This is a patient that, that they, they couldn't get the wire to go into this branch. Um, for whatever reasons, they, 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 every time they tried to get a, a wire in there, they couldn't get it to go. But because the tip of this is 2.4 French, you're able to actually engage the branch, put one wire down, Create a, and then put a second wire down, and now you can advance this soft purple catheter over the wires deep into the branch, which creates a rail over which you can advance uh, the subselector. So now we have our subselector in the branch, and then putting the lead in from here uh, is pretty much a done deal because you have the, the support of the subselector. Similar sort of a case, this is a patient that had uh, a previous implant failure in this target branch here, and they could get the subselector into the branch, uh, but they couldn't get the subselector deep into the branch. So the patient ended up going for epicardial leads. The epicardial leads failed after three weeks, or excuse me, three months. So now it's now we're, all we all we do differently this time is have a vein selector. It's nothing magic, and it's very straightforward. Um, but we now have this little soft purple catheter that allows you to engage the branch and then put, the, put wires in, two wires in, and it's very soft. So you can, you can advance this over those wires deep into the branch, and then over that you can advance your subselector. In this case, it was a, a CPS AIM catheter over the subselector, and now we have the lead in place. Another, sort of, another case, very similar case, this is a patient that had three different doctors working on it for several hours, and they couldn't get the lead in, and it's the same problem. The, the problem was they could get the subselector, the subselector they could get right to there, but they couldn't get it in the branch, and after many hours, they ended up going anterior, they went inferior, and they ended up putting the lead in the um, anterior interventricular vein, and using the vein selector very simply, 
putting the vein selector in over a wire, creating a rail, and then advancing the subselector over the vein selector, the case is done. So it was a, a three-hour case without the vein selector, failed. It was actually longer than that, but it was many, many hour case, multiple physicians trying using the standard equipment that you're provided by the device companies. Um, and with just the addition of a simple vein selector, uh, the case was done as if it was just an ordinary, everyday case. Uh, simple case. Um, I wanted to mention the AMPLAT support wire technique. We mentioned this briefly, but again, this is sort of a standard, easy to do technique. Um, it requires a, a Cook Amplatz wire. It's very important that it's Cook, a vein selector. And what we do is if you know that there's a branch close to the os of the CS, it can be difficult to get that in. And that's what happened here is they couldn't get the, they couldn't get the lead in. And so the way we approach this is to uh, put a, uh, this is, this is a, the, the, the vertebral vein selector goes in over a glide wire the glide wire comes out, and then the Amplatz wire goes in. So this is just a standard step-by-step, -step. I have this problem, I have this solution. And it's not a trick, it's, it's a very, just a standard approach for, for a difficult situation, but it requires the appropriate tools. And so we, we switch out uh, the glide wire, and then, then you leave the Amplatz wire in place, um, and once the Amplatz wire is in place, uh, then you can put the vein selector back in, the vertebral shaped vein selector, back in with a, with a subselector. And here's the, the vein selector here beside the wire. Now, the important point here is you, not, you need nine French. You need an access that's large enough that you can leave the wire in there and stabilize the sheath. And so we're, we've left the wire in and we stabilize the sheath. And now we can just drag the sheath out of the way because the, the takeoff of this branch is somewhere down here. So if the sheath is still in the CS, you can't get to that branch because the sheath is covering it up. So by having the wire in there, uh, you, can, you, can, uh, you can find the branch. And so initially, we got into the middle cardiac vein. So the nice part about the system is that if you get into the middle cardiac vein, which is really not where you want it to be, you just pull everything, you just pull the vein selector back and go into the, back into the CS, uh, and then repeat the process, and then you can look for this, this branch that had its takeoff very close to the os, and engage it. And again, this is, there's actually a stenosis here, but by, by using the vein selector and creating a rail, you can slide your subselector over the vein selector and get, now this is the, the vein, the, the subselector being advanced over this purple vein selector, uh, and then it's a done deal. The case is done. So I think I just ran out of time. Um, so, but the, the idea is, is that, to, to my way of thinking, the biggest limitation, it remains the biggest limitation, if you're going to do MRIs and figure out where you got to put the leech, you need to be able to get them there. And, and the way I see it is that if you, if you stick with the existing tool system that you're provided by the, by the device companies, you can only do so much. And it's not a skill issue. It's a matter of having better tools. Um, and um, unfortunately, it requires the person doing the procedure to make the effort to get the tools because they don't bring them to you, right? <laughs> you, have to, you have to go out and get them, and then you have to learn to use them, and, then, and, that, and that takes a real effort. So, whether people are willing to make the effort to get these tools will determine whether uh, the, there's an increase, an improvement, I think, in, in the results of, of LV pacing. And if I heard it right, 10% of patients went for epicardial leads in, your, in the study? 10% of patients went for an epicardial lead. With this system, less than 1% need to go for an epicardial lead or an endocardial lead. Uh, it, you just don't need it because you, there's a solution to these problems. Uh, but again, it's not something that's provided to you on a, on a silver platter uh, when you do the procedure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wolfgang. Okay, so let's move uh, to the final, to the last presentation, and it's left ventricular endocardial pacing by Tim Betts.
Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to come and speak. Ah, there we go. So after that um, last presentation, you may think that my talk's redundant <laughs> because it's only for 1% of people, but I, I may um, persuade you otherwise. So these are my um, disclosures. And what I'm going to talk about is why you might want to undertake endocardial pacing, how effective it is, everyone always wants to know about the risk of embolic stroke, and then last of all, how to perform it. So you've already seen some very nice examples of the challenges which we face with traditional, conventional CRT. You only have to look at some of these papers and then try a few cases to see how many valves there are which are challenging our access to the coronary sinus, or even when we get in there, there are more problems within the veins themselves. Prior surgery, stenosed uh, vessels, and then even if you can get into a branch, you may find the phrenic nerve or scar means that you cannot actually pace at that site. So what is the true failure rate? I think it's, it's difficult to, to know. These are a, a meta-analysis of trials um, from all the big studies, the randomized controlled trials, and uh, stopping up at about 2011. So in those, there was a 2 to 3% failure rate to implant an LV lead. It's interesting to hear it was only 1% in the survey, perhaps there's a selection bias, but if you don't implant a lead, you don't fill in the form for the survey and then 10% were epicardial, unless they were the surgeons who were choosing to do that first up without a failure. I don't, I don't know. Um, and of course, you may get the lead in, and the patient goes home, and you think, I've got a lovely chest X-ray, but then six weeks later, the lead is not always in the same place. Leads displace. Sometimes it's because of poor anatomy, sometimes it's because the patient twiddles, and sometimes we just don't know. And I have the same opinion about epicardial surgical leads. I really don't like them. I, I don't think patients do very well from them. It's a big procedure for people with heart failure comorbidities. And unless you have an enthusiastic surgeon who's very keen to place the lead in a good position, they often turn up in an anterior position near the septum, and you don't get good resynchronization and a good ECG. Um, and you've already heard non-response. Not just not getting a lead in. If we get a lead in, it doesn't always do very well. We have a technology which at best gives us two-thirds of people getting a good response. One-third of people go through this and they aren't any better. And people who don't respond don't do well. Is it value for money? Of course not. Now some of the reason for not getting the best results is trying to find the best place to pace, the so-called sweet spot. And this is a real phenomenon. If you look at some of the very elegant studies which come out of Maastricht, if you get right in the middle of the sweet spot, the best place for resynchronization, you get better hemodynamics, better stroke work, better contraction and resynchronization. The further away from there you are, the less good your resynchronization attempt. And you've seen this study presented in a previous slide. <coughs> One way to get around this might be to try multi-point pacing at many different sites. In this study, they tried two sites, three sites, four sites, and then simultaneously at seven sites. But if you took the best site and just did single point pacing there, you were just as good. So if you can get to the optimal site, you only need single site pacing in the left ventricle. And you've also seen the target and the, st and the starter studies presented. If you try and target the best place for your CRT, if you can get a lead there, then you tend to do well. If you avoid scar, you get better resynchronization, etc. Um, if you don't get there, or if you just randomly put your lead in a good fluoroscopic position, you don't always do so well. And as you heard, you may try to target a lead, but how often can you get the lead to the place of latest mechanical activation away from scar? It depends on the venous anatomy. Is there a vein there? Is the phrenic nerve there? Is there scar there? Is there a high threshold? So using conventional CRT, it's, it is quite difficult to target leads. So how often do we get there? Well, if you, this is some older data, but again, if you look at the most recent survey, a lot of patients still end up with a lead in an anterior vein, the middle cardiac vein, in a very apical position. 
If you've got a 99% success rate of getting a left ventricular lead, that doesn't matter if 10 or 20% of those leads are in bad veins, in bad positions. And from your own survey, um, at seven or eight years ago, only, well, less than two-thirds uh, of, of implanters thought that their leads ended up in optimal positions. So, there are a lot of challenges through pacing through the coronary veins, which may be overcome by using an, an endocardial pacing route. But we're talking about responders and non-responders, as if CRT is a binary thing. But it isn't. There's also a magnitude of response. If we can get someone to respond, perhaps we should try and make them a better responder, or even a super responder. Because super responders do better. If you can really improve that left ventricular function dramatically and get a really fantastic response, you live longer, you do better. So, is endocardial pacing better than epicardial pacing? Well, we'll start off by looking at some of the uh, animal models comparing the two. And in this study of a left bundle branch block model with normal left ventricular function, you can tell from the color maps that when you pace and stimulate endocardially, there is more rapid activation. There's just a smaller number of colors <laughs> widely spaced because of rapid activation. And that translates to better resynchronization and better acute hemodynamics than using epicardial pacing. What about a heart failure model? Well, the same thing applies, and whether that's heart failure from um, a myocardial infarction or pacing-induced tachycardia cardiomyopathy, if you do endocardial biventricular stimulation, <coughs> you get faster activation, better resynchronization, better acute hemodynamics than if you do epicardial stimulation. And why might that be? In this very elegant computer modeling study, which threw in a lot of uh, different parameters, including scar and fiber orientation. The reasons are quite simple. If you stimulate the endocardium, you may actually recruit Purkinje fibers and facilitate conduction around the endocardium faster than if it, you're pacing from the epicardium. We all know if you look at LV-only pacing when you're testing the threshold of your lead, doesn't that QRS complex look really wide with a very slow, slurred onset? It may also just be simp simply the fact that if you stimulate the endocardium and you have to travel to the other side of the ventricle, the route you have to go is shorter. It's a smaller circle than trying to go around the epicardium. But what about in real-world patients? And there are a number of um, sm uh, small studies, mainly coming out of St. Thomas's group, comparing endocardial and epicardial pacing with multi-site pacing, uh, epicardially as well as endocardially. And in this elegant example, again, a long study, lots of pacing sites, multiple um, uh, uh, wires in different veins as well as a roving catheter at different sites in the ventricle. The best endocardial pacing site for biventricular pacing was superior to multi-site, multi-point pacing epicardially using acute hemodynamics. But it was very patient-specific. You had to map around and find the best place. In this group of non-responders who came back to the lab for mapping different epicardial veins, endocardial, a better response was achieved with endocardial pacing in the majority of patients. And even when you compared the same anatomical position, the same segment, epicardial and endocardial, endocardial was better, a narrower QRS, a better uh, increase in acute hemodynamic response. A quick look at the meta-analysis of the studies of, which are of endocardial pacing which are out there show that there is a clinical response rate of around about 80% in a very mixed group of patients. So how to do it? Well, there's the atrial transeptal approach. This is not a new technique. This first publication is now 20 years old. <coughs> and there are plenty of other publications. And everyone has a different technique. And as you can see, it involves femoral access in the majority, snares, trying to pull wires across the atrial septum. 
So this is an approach which was perhaps refined and I would say is the most uh, commonly used approach, certainly for the all-sync study, with a superior approach using a, a steerable sheath, a radio frequency guide wire to puncture the atrial septum and then um, inserting a lead. But of course the problem here is your lead is going through the left atrium and it's crossing the mitral valve. Or you could get a friendly surgeon to come and help you. And in fact, we joined in with the, the group here and did a few cases with a direct apical puncture into the left ventricle. I then put in the active fixation lead and it was tunneled up to the generator which was in the pocket. Or you can puncture from a large chamber into an even larger chamber. And if I can just get this to play. So you can puncture the ventricular septum. So this is a technique which I've developed where you um, outline the left ventricle. I no longer do the contrast injections because I'm familiar with the anatomy. From a superior approach, you insert a steerable agilis sheath, usually used for catheter ablation. You can uh, pull the dilator back, position it against the septum, and then using the stiff straight end of the guide wire and a diathermy pen, you can transmit that energy and you can puncture the septum from the right ventricle into the left ventricle just by pushing the guide wire through. And you know when you're in there because often it goes to the other side and you get ectopics with a classic left ventricular morphology, a big R wave and V1. Then you can slide the agilis in and then exchange that for a slittable sheath. Uh, for example, the Medtronic deflectable uh, CS catheter. Having done that, you insert your lead, either a standard active fixation lead or the select secure lead. And the advantage with this is you can map around the left ventricle to a degree. And you're not inhibited by phrenic nerve uh, capture. Um, it's just really a matter of avoiding scar. And as that technique developed, we've got faster and faster at doing it. So just to quickly run through a tip one case study of that, here's a patient with dysynchrony. Um, uh, here's the, getting the, the sheath into position in an RAO and LAO view, lining it up using radio frequency energy. You can see this person has already had a failed epicardial surgical lead, so they came back for this. Slide, and th this was a study where we then put an ablation catheter in and used the 3D mapping system, the precision system, to map the site of latest electrical activation so that we could target it. We mapped the intrinsic rhythm and with RV pacing. We measured the acute hemodynamic response at a number of different sites and then attached the uh, endocardial lead and here's the result. And there you can just see the lead in there crossing the left ventricle. And we got a lovely narrowing down to 138 milliseconds of the QRS. We got a fantastic improvement in the uh, synchrony measurements with the speckle tracking echo and they had a very good functional response and even a reduction in their atrial fibrillation uh, burden. And I'll quickly move through this for the interest of time as we have a, been studying these. I've actually done about 40 patients, but 20 were involved in the hemodynamic study with the mapping and selecting the best site based upon latest electrical activation. And although they were a mixed group of non-responders as well as people with failed implants, we got some very good results. But anticoagulation is needed, and to do endocardial pacing with the lead, I do the procedure with therapeutic warfarin, aiming for a target of uh, INR of 3.0. And that brings up the big question about the thromboembolic risk. Is there a risk of leaving a left ventricular lead, uh, an endocardial lead, inside the left ventricular cavity? Um, well, there must be a it does certainly mandates anticoagulation. And as I've said, we aim for a target INR with warfarin of, of three. Now, looking at a meta-analysis of all the published series of endocardial pacing, we can try and get a stroke, TIA, and death rate, and then compare that to heart failure patients um, without anticoagulation or in other studies. And if you look at it closely, there is probably a slight increase of maybe 1% to 2% per year of an ischemic event, despite taking anticoagulants. However, when these are reported, if you look in the papers, it's usually when the INR level was subtherapeutic, as you might expect with people who have prosthetic valves as well. Is that an acceptable price to pay if someone then becomes a responder to CRT and their heart failure symptoms are improved and maybe their prognosis improved? Well, many of the patients undergoing this would say yes, they would be prepared to take warfarin 
uh, and accept that slightly higher risk if it turned them into a responder. Um, and of course, the uh, new oral anticoagulants may be an option as well. But there are ways to do endocardial pacing without the need for anticoagulation. So one option, which again from the um, Maastricht group, is to take your active fixation select secure lead, attach it to the septum, start screwing it in, and just keep going until you come out on the endocardial surface of the, of the left ventricle. And so you paste the endocardium on the septum. Now this was a group of patients who had um, normal left ventricular function. But what they showed is you change the QRS morphology if you paste the LV septum, you get a narrower QRS, and the acute hemodynamics were better. Now my own experience of doing septal pacing in the left ventricle with heart failure patients is that it is not as good as doing lateral wall pacing stimulation. And that brings me on now to the ultrasound-based stimulation system, the EBR systems YCRT. Now this is a, a form of left ventricular stimulation for people who already have a conventional pacemaker or ICD in place, because that is needed. That's called the co-implant. What the system consists of is a generator, an ultrasound transmitter, which is placed subcutaneously, and the ultrasound, transmit, uh, ultrasound receiver, which you place in the left ventricular endocardium. When the indwelling right ventricular lead stimulates the right ventricle, when they are paced, the system picks up the pacing spike. It then immediately sends out a pulse of ultrasound directed towards the left ventricular receiver, and that piezoelectric crystal is able to convert that acoustic energy into electrical energy and stimulate the left ventricle. And it does it within about four milliseconds of the pacing spike. So you get simultaneous left ventricular stimulation. And I showed an example there from the old pictures of the old transmitter. The newer device is um, better shaped to fit in between the, uh, the ribs in the intercostal space. The size of the receiver is tiny. It's like a grain of rice which means you do not need to anticoagulate when it's implanted into the left ventricular endocardium. So here are just a few slides from an implant. Um, it's not that different from doing a subcutaneous ICD with the generator in the axilla in a subcutaneous pocket. You make an incision in a good acoustic window, usually the fifth intercostal space. You divide the pectoralis muscle, expose the intercostal, and then attach the device to that. And then through a uh, femoral arterial puncture, you pass the sheath retrogradely into the left ventricle. You slide the device down. Oop, go back. And you position it against the left ventricular wall. You can map around. You can move around the internal surface. You can measure a QLV to find the latest electrical activation. You check a conventional threshold <coughs> because your device at this point is connected electrically to the PSA. And then by doing little squirts of contrast, you make sure that you're up against the wall and you start to push the device out of the end. And when you see that it has the little barb on the end has punctured into the muscle and it's secured, you can then let it go. And here it's very hard to see because it's such a small device, but there's the receiver. And you go from a wide QRS to a lovely biventricular pacing ECG. And there's one publication, the Select LV study out there, which summarizes some of the early experience and, uh, in, in 35 patients. Um, a, a third of them were people who were um, non-responders. And it works as a, a biventricular pacing, as you'd imagine. You get, uh, depending on what response rate you look at, whether it's uh, echocardiographic, where they say it's 52, but if you look at a, clinic, a composite clinical uh, score response, 85% of people in that study were classified as responders. But there are issues potentially with complications, and the vascular access, the groin puncture in the femoral artery, does lead into a few problems. We close them with a per close, but it, in, as time comes by, we may be able to do this through a venous puncture and an atrial tran transeptal approach to get into the left ventricle rather than a retrograde arterial approach. So just to summarize, endocardial pacing could be undertaking when you, you can't book Dr. Worley in or get hold of his equipment. Uh, and coronary venous LV lead pacing is impossible, or perhaps when it's ineffective in non-responders. It does have the potential to create a greater response, perhaps a bigger magnitude of response, at least the acute hemodynamics would suggest that. 
but it does necessitate lifelong anticoagulation if you're using a lead, but there are now leadless options. Thank you very much.